Good evening. Welcome to the second event of the three-day Wanren film screening series. After last night's screening of the film Super Citizen Co, we are honored to have Dr. Silver Ling here to give a lecture entitled Accountability and Redemption. Redemption, sorry. A cinematic representation of atrocity in Taiwan. This lecture reflects on how Taiwanese cinema makes sense of the past and deals with national uh, trauma. Before Dr. Ling um, resigned recently to become a full-time writer and translator, she was associate professor of Chinese in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Notre Dame. She is a prolific researcher, writer, and translator, and has won many awards for her sophisticated uh, translations. For example, she's a winner of the Liang Shiqiu Literary Translation Prize. In addition, she has also written quite a lot of books. Uh, for example, a single author book on representing atrocity in Taiwan, the 22A incident and the white terror in Taiwan, that's published in 2007 in America. Um, uh, so actually, this particular book, uh, there's a chapter focused and dedicated to Wan Ren's uh, this, particular book, uh, this particular film. And also, she also co-edited uh, a volume uh, documenting Taiwan on film, issues and methods in new documentaries. And it was uh, published in 2012. Let's, um, later, when the lecture finished, uh, Nikki will be announcing actually he's going to uh, uh, sell some copies of books that are provided by Roundage um, at a very good price. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now, please let's put our hands together and give her a warm welcome, Dr. Selma Ling. Please. Thank you. Good evening. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Phil for inviting me here, and then thank you all for coming. I understand the summer is the downtime, and I'm very happy that you are here. Um, I, I just wanted to know uh, if every one of you have seen the movie last night? Yes. Okay. Quite. Okay. So I won't be... Uh, um, I won't... I, I won't be giving a synopsis of the, the movie, if uh, that's all right. Okay. But um, in order to contextualize the film and make my arguments more understanding, understandable, I think I'll give a very brief historical background. So for those of you who are familiar with Taiwan, please bear with me. Um, I will start with 1945. Uh, when Japan surrendered in 1945, Taiwan became part of the Republic of China, headed by Chiang Kai-shek. Problem following the end of the war and with the withdrawal of the colonial government was compounded by other troubles resulting from the arrival of the new government, which culminated in the February 28th incident, when Taiwan was plunged into a flurry of protest uprisings an armed rebellion. On March 8, a large contingent of troops from the Chinese mainland arrived in northern China to quell the unrest. When order was finally restored in late March, 10 to 20,000 Taiwanese had been killed or disappeared. In late 1949, the nationalist government was driven off the mainland by the communists and fled to Taiwan. In May 1949, Martial law was declared to ensure the total submission of the Taiwanese, thus beginning a reign of white terror, and the 228 incident became a taboo. In the name of stability and security, the nationalist government immediately stripped residents of Taiwan of their civil liberties, creating an atmosphere of pervasive fear with the garrison command responsible for arresting and punishing individuals who allegedly threatened national security and public order. Civilians were subject to arrest by military personnel and trial by military courts. 
by one estimate, military courts trial the cases of more than 10,000 civilians. When many of those, while many of those arrested were intellectuals who voiced dissent, there was also a substantial number of innocent people falsely incarcerated, either by overeager agents of the garrison command or vengeful enemies who made false accusations. Family members of those who died or disappeared in the immediate aftermath of the 228 incident were harassed and watched. Intellectuals were often charged with sedition simply because they belonged to reading groups, like the main character in the film you saw last night. Mm. Even those who were abroad could not escape the net of persecution. The national government installed spies were recruited informants among overseas students to report on anyone who voiced criticism of the government and or were engaged in activities related to the mainland communist China. Once martial law was lifted in 1987, the floodgates opened and in rushed an outpouring of text on Taiwan's past, including fiction, collections of poetry, reportage, memoirs, eyewitness accounts, historical research, archival documents, conference proceedings, and feature and documentary films, as the people in Taiwan felt the urgent need to remember, reconstruct, and rewrite that part of their history. What is at stake in this reconstruction process is best illustrated by Pierre Janet's distinction of habit memory the automatic integration of new information without much con conscious attention to what is happening, and narrative memory, consisting of mental constructs which people use to make sense out of experience. In the case of post-martial law Taiwan, where many people feel they have been robbed of their past, there lies the danger that what one reads or sees in literary and cinematic text may not be actively or consciously analyzed. Uninterrogated textual and screen memories then form one's own memory of the past. On the, on the other hand, as Dominic Lecabra points out in his discussion of memory as a crucial source for history and its complicated relations to documentary source, and I quote, even in the falsification, repression, displacement, and denials. Memory can nonetheless be informative, not in terms of an accurate empirical representation of its subject, but in terms of that subject's open anxiety-ridden reception and assimilation by both participants in events and those born later." End of quote. The issue then is not to reject memory as unreliable, but to be informed of its imperfect nature as one members the past without being paralyzed or manipulated by that memory. Confronting the Taiwanese is also the problem of imagining an event that the writers and filmmakers <coughs> themselves have not lived through and have to reconstruct out of someone else's memory, be that someone, a government archive, or survivors of, survivors of the event. Consequently, people who must often learn about their past through textual and cinematic representations are similarly twice, twice removed from that past. Memory is never innocent. How and what one remembers is inevitably colored by one's perspective or politics, especially when dealing with atrocity. What is termed the politics of memory is, in effect, rhetoric about the past mobilized for political purposes. It is precisely this politi politics of memory that demands these texts to be examined closely. For a film that is based on someone else's memory, Super Citizen Quo provides us with an opportunity to look at the case of Taiwan in dealing with government atrocity. Super Citizen Quo re revolves around Xi Yishun, an intellectual who was a member of a reading group in the 1950s. Like many of his contemporaries, he is arrested for reading prohibited material 
and charged with an intent to subvert the government. While under torture, he reveals the name of another reading group member, Chen Zhengyi, who then takes the blame as the leader of the group and is later executed. And here, the, the name, I, I don't know if uh, Wan Ren, the director, mentioned the name yesterday. The Xu Yisheng, the name is, uh, in Taiwan is Ko Yixing, mm -hmm. meaning to suffer to one's life. Chen Zheng Yi, Zheng Yi is justice. So when justice is dead, the Taiwanese have to suffer their whole life. Um, Ko is sentenced to 16 years in prison on an offshore island. Shortly after the beginning of his incarceration, Ko hands a divorce paper to his devoted wife with the intention of sparing her embarrassment and suffering. But she commits suicide, leaving her young daughter to fend for herself. When Ko is released, he goes into self-imposed exile, cocooning himself in a nursing home for 12 years until one day a dream about the execution of Chen Zhengyi prompts him to re-enter society and embark on a quest for Chen's burial site. Settling into the comfortable apartment of his now married daughter, Ko roams the street of Taipei and travels out of town, looking up old friends to inquire into the location of Chen's gravesite. When he finally finds it in an overgrown bamboo grove, Ko lights up the area with candles to offer his apology. The film starts in media res with Ko waking up in the nursing home, and his past is relived and recounted to the audience through interior monologue during his quest. Well, sometimes you feel like he's, it's part of his diary, like he's writing a diary, but nevertheless, it's interior monologue that it is in his head. Okay. One critic has argued that what Ko is searching for is himself, and his only path to redemption is trying to find his friend's gravesite. If we follow this analysis that Ko's search is a kind of self-rediscovery, then the memory dredged up in the process becomes a form of redemption that finally delivers him from his suffering over his past action. We also find reinforcements of this interpretation in the candlelit ending, but we must ask how this redemption is possible or whether it is even necessary, and how the film as a cinematic recreation of the white terror informs us, inform our understanding of representing government persecution of intellectuals. Finally, it remains questionable as to how closure functions. This evening, I would like to focus on two aspects of the film, cinematic recreational, recreational government atrocity and the issue of accountability. Much of what we learn about Ko's past and present emotional state is relate, related through his interior monologue. Although it is a convenient and convincing cinematic technique for an old man who has just come out of self-imposed isolation, interior monologue it is, is in itself a strategic option. For soliloquy and interior monologue are cinematic codes for exteriorizing thought. Their conventions work to the, in, to the same end in making unspoken thoughts available to the audience whether the character is alone or in the presence of others. When this language undertakes to tell a story, we have a narr narrational activity that calls for a covering term to represent a common mental origin, the, the mind screen narration. What is most illuminating in the employment of this technique is the fact that mind screen narration were not limited to being tools for conveying the main story, but were seized upon for dramatic scenes of self-confrontation. For Super Citizen Guo, the main character's interior monologue, in which he questions the meaning of political ideals and admits his guilt, allows him to confront a past that he has tried to suppress. In addition to the critical function of self-confrontation, interior monologue also creates a subtle but important impression of Coe's world as a former political prisoner. Since other characters may be present but do not hear the words, the sense of isolation is intensified. 
In other words, interior monologue allows the director to insulate Quo from society to stress the detrimental effect of political persecution. An invisible label has been attached to a formal political prisoner. They have no choice but to live in isolation. Moreover, the damage to their mental health and psychological well-being cannot be easily verbalized. As a consequence, Quo's interior monologue serves as a symbolic function when he talks to himself but no one else. It is not dissimilar to the attempt made by his fellow political prisoner to ensure his own safety. During the previous year, his friend, Professor Wu, has suddenly come down with a form of paranoia. He wears headphones and listens to propaganda broadcasts all day, all day long to ensure to assure the listening device that he believed the government has implanted in his head that he is nothing but pure patriotic bot. Wu's wife tells Bo that he has repeatedly told her husband that martial law has, it has been lifted, but he never believes her. As Susan Brisson points out, and quote, when a trauma is of human origin and is intentionally inflicted, it is not it not only shatters one's fundamental assumptions about the world and one's safety, safety in it, but also severs the sustaining connection between the self and the rest of humanity." End of quote. Most ironic is the fact that Professor Wu's persecution complex appears only after the lifting of martial law. When freedoms of speech and of congregation are finally available to the people, the past comes back to haunt him and plunges the victim of the white terror into a paranoid state. He is, in essence, the victim of history as tragedy, in the sense posited by a film historian. And I quote, in history as tragedy, people are seen as the product of their context, their structural consciousness, their forms of perception, their ways of being in and relating to the world have been inexorably shaped by their historical experience. They are caught in the past." End of quote. Certainly, only through such a portrayal can the devastating effect of the white terror be conveyed most profoundly. As a film that deals with the white terror, Super Citizen Guo uses flashbacks and evokes various kinds of memories to advance its central theme. As Maureen Turing points out, unquote, by suddenly presenting the past, flashbacks can abruptly offer new meanings connected to any person, place, or object. Flashbacks then gain a particularly rich dimension in the coding of the psychology of character, and because their evidence is, in, is the past, they immediately imply a psychoanalytical dimension of personality. End of quote. In Super Citizen Quo, we see ample instances of such coding, but what is most significant is that we see flashbacks of both Quo and his daughter, Xiu Qin. When their memories flash back to them, discrepancy inevitably occurs. A simple explanation for the variance is the cliché that people remember things differently. People do not have the same recollection about an event because the event does not carry the same meaning and importance to each one of them. It is through this variation in memory and interpretation of that memory that Super Citizen Quo conveys the aftermath of the white terror. The most obvious discrepancy in memory occurs in Quo's and his daughter's recollection of the prison visit during which Quo hands his wife a divorce paper. In Quo's flashback, his wife sits down, smiles, and looks up at him. A reverse shot shows Quo looking at her and giving her the divorce paper. She takes the paper, gets up, and starts to leave, then turns to look at him before finally walking away. Like most of the flashbacks, this scene is presented in complete silence, but the emotional turmoil in both characters' minds is clearly depicted through the wordless exchange between husband and wife. Later, when his daughter tells her own memory of the same visit, 
However, we see her standing behind her mother, watching the wordless exchange between her parents the whole time. When the mother gets up to leave, the daughter hesitates and then follows her mother out. The daughter's flashback of the prison scene is also presented in total silence and is not essentially different from that from what the father remembers. However, the different perspective inevitably distort their memories. To quote Maureen Turing again, certain characters get certain kinds of flashbacks at given moments, and analysis of a film can benefit from remarking not only on the presence of a given flashback, but the absence of others, not only on what information is presenting, presented in the flashback, but what is left out." End of quote. What is left out in the father's flashback is the presence of the daughter, and as she complains to, to her aging father later, her feelings and her life after the mother's suicide. Early in the film, we are already familiar with the father's lack of interaction with her his daughter as well as with her husband and son. Her recollection of the prison scene highlights her absence in her father's mind. Critic Chen Wuxiu argues that, quote, gradually realizes that he is forgotten by the world just as he forgot about his wife and daughter as he wasted his life for his ideals. In other words, Chen believes that the aging quote is looking back at his life in regret and wishes undone. As Chen said, for he wants to prove that past, the past is just a dream and nothing is real, end of quote. While we cannot deny that Quo's youth was ruined by the absurdity of the era of the white terror, it is oversimplifying the situation to reach Super Citizen Quo as a film about regret for one's youth. In my view, the film exemplifies a persistent question of allocating appropriate narrative space to the public and the private. The public, as with the government control of apparatus, is constantly invading the private sphere of familial life. We detect a contest between the private and the public in these two flashbacks. For Kuo, the intellectual who joined a reading group his concern was the public, the political situation of Taiwan in the 1950s. His decision to divorce his wife in the belief that he would spare her hardship is made with little regard for her private emotional state, which is best illustrated in her suicide. For his daughter, on the other hand, the ordeal is all personal, which is why she is dead set against getting involved in politics. A flashback of the boat ride home after the fatal visit further accentuates the contrast between father's and daughter's memories. Her mother is standing against the wind, and the daughter watches her mother as the latter rips the divorce paper to pieces. To be sure, Quo has no way of knowing about the boat trip. However, the daughter's recollection of the trip indirectly reveals the effect of the white terror on the people's private life. In her case, her father is arrested because he has read some books with a few friends. And unbeknownst to her, she will soon become a, a virtual or orphan. The flashback is most poignant for an adult recall recalling the incident many years later. For she now knows what the paper entails and what goes on in her heartbroken mother's mind. Her father's well-intentioned plan ultimately causes a mother's death. In the white terror era, there was no distinction between the public and the private. For everything one does and things fall into the all-pervasive jurisdiction of the police state. A telling example is given in the film. The sister of another persecuted is sentenced to three years in prison simply because she served tea to the reading group when they gather at her house. The notion that private life can never be safe from the invasive and pervasive government control mechanism is further reinforced in a different kind of memory, which I shall call fabricated, fabricated memory, in that the characters either dream or imagine a scene in the past that they cannot have witnessed. In the beginning of the film, 
before the opening credits, we see the headlights of trucks in the dark slithering through a wild field. One of the tr trucks turned out to be a military vehicle transporting soldiers who will then execute the prisoners in the other truck. Then we see three prisoners kneel on the ground, and one after another they are shot in the back. Except for the three gunshots, the scene, like others, does not have any conversation among characters. The next scene shows a trembling hand clawing at a blanket. The camera then slowly pans up to Paul's sleeping face. He opens his eyes and the camera cuts to the execution scene again in which the third prisoner, obviously Chen Zhengyi, falls forward as the bullet pierces his body, dark blood oozing out to stain his white shirt. A slight variation of the scene reappears as Paul's flashback when he visits Youth Park, the former execution ground. In this scene, Chen is shown in full frontal shot when he looks up and then falls forward at the sound of the gunshot. As critics have pointed out, Kuo cannot have witnessed the execution of his friend. Rather, he dreams or creates the scene out of his own imagination after seeing Chen's raised hand to indicate the sentence he has received. In one of the flashbacks, Kuo hears the sound of chains clanging against the floor and walks up to the opening on his prison cell door to see Chen being led away. Chen raises his hand, his left showing two fingers of his left hand and one of his right hand, indicating the death sentence for political prisoners according to Article 2, Section 1 of the Martial Law. The knowledge gained from Chen's hand gesture leads Kuo to fabricate the scene of Chen's execution and serve as the motivational force behind his termination of self-exile. But as observed by Robert T, quote, since Kuo himself was not present at this event, nor does he find any witness to the execution, the image wavers between Kuo's point of view dream vision and the reality that no one in the film claims, end of quote. The film strongly suggests that execution scene in, is part of Quo's dream, but the scene is repeated, shown with slight variation in the form of flashbacks. To some, the repetitive and gory side of an execution may seem gratuitous or, and unnecessary. Needless to say, the issue concerning the cathartic function of screen violence can never be resolved, and hence it may be fruitful for us to, re to consider instead the mnemonic power of Quo's fabrication or dream. That is, as a movie with a clear ideologi ideological agenda, Super Citizen Quo does not simply recreate a page of Taiwan's history, the past. Instead, it also creates a memory of that past, the future knowledge of the past. For screen memory cannot be strictly individual in, so mu in as much as it is symbolic and hence into subjective. The director once disclosed in an interview that he was interested in creating a contrast between past and present to conduct a sort of reflection on Taiwan. But this process is far from being a mere cinematic recreation. Instead, it has strong political ramification, as one historian puts it. What we are faced with, what we are living, is the constitution of both group membership and individual identity out of a dynamically chosen selection of memories and the contrast reshape, constant reshaping, reinvention, and reinforcement of those memories are members contest, as members con contest and create the boundaries and links among themselves." End of quote. In similar fashion, but focusing again on the private domain, Kuo's daughter Xiu Qin fabricates a memory about her mother's death in a flashback from her perspective. After the mother and daughter return home from the visit, during which Kuo hands his wife the divorce paper, Xiu Qin is seen sitting on the bed to let her mother comb her hair. Xiu Qin then goes to sleep, while her mother stares at herself in the mirror and swallows some pills. 
Then the camera cuts to the mother sitting against the Japanese style door frame, burning letters and a wedding photo. Xiu Qing cannot have witnessed her mother's activity. More likely, she later infers them from the ashes and perhaps from a diagnosis of her mother's, uh, the cause of her mother's death. This imagined scene is inserted in Xiu Qing's flashback between her recollection of the boat ride from, ho from the boat ride home and the memory of her mother playing the piano one last time. These details form the memory of a young girl whose father's action in a, inadvertently brings on her mother's suicide and leaves her an orphan. Xiu Qing's fabricated memory serves two purposes. First, by inserting this imagined scene in her recollection of her mother's last visit, she points a finger at her father for neglecting her, his responsibility as a husband and a father, thus dispelling the myth about the family of political prisoners. Wernon revealed in the same interview his objection to the heroic and sympathetic images portrayed in print media. He said, in fact, I discovered that subconsciously they, the family members of political prisoners, were bitter and were unable to forgive, resentful even. Mm -hmm. End of quote. Xiu Qing's resentment offers an important, if symbolic, symbolic dissenting voice in the representation of white terror and explodes the monolithic memory of the victims and their family members as understanding and self-sacrificing. Yet, one cannot ignore the fact that Xiu Qing's mother commits suicide without regard for her well-being. After her mother's death, she is passed around among relatives and must deal with pol police harassment alone. How do we then interpret the problem of culpability? Is the film implying that the KMT's fault police during the white terror is the sole culprit and that people like Kuo, his wife, and daughter are sim simply collateral damage. To answer these questions, we must return to the issue of memory in flashback and the notion that a chosen selection of memory shapes and reshape a social group and an individual. In the case of Subversism Guo, one can posit that Xiu Qing's memories are intended to be representative of the memories of all victims of the white terror and more importantly, the memories of the Taiwanese in total. The film appeals to the sensibility of the average moviegoer and lacks a greater measure of profound self in reflection. There is an easily discernible parallel between the film creating the story of victims of white terror and the daughter of a political prisoner imagining the last scene of a mother's death. Consequently, in a perverse but clearly unintended way, the film calls into question the construction and transmission of memory. The past remains mired in the past for Xiu Qing, and her memories, fabricated or real, serve primarily to vent her resentment and bitterness. She is, in a word, representative of the kind of victim's family that dramatizes the director's politics. When a part of the past is presented as a flashback in Super Citizen Quo, with few exceptions, it is attached to either Quo or his daughter as memory, imagined or not. And precisely because of the differences in their disparate perspectives, the screen memories they impart to the audience serve to underscore the disastrous repercussions of Taiwan's, Taiwanese suffered under martial law. These screen effects are furthermore achieved through flashbacks with unknown or unclear originators, or what I will call floating memories, and their function in conveying the notion of redemption. In one scene with floating memory, Quo approaches a noodle stand. The camera moves closer and closer from Quo's perspective to finally focus on the stand owner's face. The owner looks up and blinks a few times in the watery mist of the stinging noodles, followed by a brief flashback of Quo on the truck, very likely after the search of his house. In his flashback, Quo is shown in a medium shot, looking slightly to his left, possibly at the birthmark on the soldier's face. 
Then the camera cuts to the soldier who lights a cigarette and exhales before returning to look at Quo. These two scenes have the effect of a shot reverse shot, often used in the scene when two characters are engaged in a conversation. We are usually shown the face of A speaking, then the camera cuts to B. This reversal of perspective gives the audience the impression that we are looking at A from B's per angle and looking at B from A's per viewpoint. If we apply this reading to the two scenes in flashbacks, we first look at the soldier from Quo's perspective as the former lights up his cigarette. Then we see Quo from the, so the soldier's point of view. If this is the case, the flashback is an, an ambiguous originator, for it could be Quo or the former soldier turned noodle stand owner, or it could be both. The blurring of flashback perspective implies that both the soldier and Quo are implicated in a political turmoil that is beyond their control. Later, when the former soldier and the former political prisoner sit down at a noodle stand to share a drink, the former soldier says with a straight face, Back then, I was, only in ch I was only charged with arresting people. The subtext of his declarative statement is that he was simply following orders and was but a cock in the KMT's machinery of op operation, oppression and persecution. Mm -hmm. In their conversation, the former soldier says to Kuo that Taiwanese were not the only group targeted, as many mainlanders who uttered any discontent were also arrested and sentenced to eight to ten years in prison. In a somewhat apologist fashion, the former soldiers offer the explanation for the KMT's policy that many innocent people were arrested in order to ensure that not a single communist infiltrator was spared which was precisely the circumstance of the white terror. In the heyday of the collective anti-communist paranoia, everyone was a suspect, and everyone could be the patriot who helped expose the communist if one was vigilant enough. The political climate at the time demanded that everyone be part of the anti-communist enterprise. As a consequence, participants, like the former soldier, can be excused for taking part in enforcing the law. However, much as when we like to forgive food soldiers, like the food noodle stand owner, the scene still conveys a sense of absurdity, which forcing the audience to reflect upon issues of reconciliation and responsibility. On the one hand, one feels a sense of unease at seeing the former political prisoner drinking with the same, the man who ransacked his house and terrified his family, not to mention that the organization he served indirectly caused the death of his wife. <coughs> On the other hand, one wonders exactly how such an encounter should be portrayed cinematically. Werner's original plan for the movie was to depict a former political prisoner's search for those who were responsible for his incarceration and to seek revenge. But he changed his mind when you learn more about the families of the victims. Mm -hmm. Redemption replaces revenge as the central theme of the film, hence the floating memory of the scene on the truck and the post-incarceration encounter at the noodle stand. The wordless exchange of gazes on the truck becomes an emblematic gesture toward future reconciliation. For the unclear originator of the flashback, metaphorically blurs the difference between the perpetrator and the victim. However, one cannot help but wonder if state terror like this kind can be easily <clears throat> forgiven by simply invoking the specter of white terror. That is, questions remain as to whether or not the soldier did indeed believe that the formation of a reading group threatened national security, and whether all past wrongs could be simply written off as a malaise of a less democratic time. The fundamental issue raised by this scene has larger political and perhaps ethical ramifications. Can a perpetrator, however minor a role he plays, be absolved of his responsibility because the political climate gave him no option but to follow orders? And should a film addressing atrocity promote such an approach to history? 
I cannot help but being reminded of a scene from Alain Hosnay's Night and Fog in which one after another the German SS members proclaimed that they were not responsible. Perhaps the intention here is to be inclusive in addressing issue of restitution between the perpetrators and the survivors in this scene portraying Paul's meeting with the former soldier and the flashback of his arrest. But the encounter, in a paradoxical way, questioned the healing effect of memory. Memory, it seems, brings more suffering to Quo. In the conversation, the former soldier, with somewhat irrepressible pleasure, reveals to Quo that he has long retired from the garrison command and has opened a noodle stand with his wife and daughter. He said, life isn't bad. And then he asked, what about your wife? Well-intentioned though it may be, the question seemed thoughtless and cruel beyond description. All Quo can do is keep drinking. To be sure, Quo's search for the former soldier has nothing to do with his wife or his family's life. His sole concern is finding Chen's gravesite so he can be rid of the guilt that has caused his self-imposed exile and tormented him for many years. Moreover, implied in the scene is also a contrast between the former perpetrator of terror and his victim. The former has his family and a humble but comfortable life, while the latter lost his wife and is estranged from his only remaining family member. The recalling of the past in this scene is devoid of therapeutic power, and remembrance seems only to heighten Quo's determination to locate Chen's grave. On the other hand, memory does bring diver deliverance for Quo when he finally locates Chen's bur burial site. His subconscious can conjure up the memory of his wife. Though the scene is not a flashback recollection in the strictest sense, at the end of the film, when Quo returns to his daughter's apartment after the candlelighting episode, he collapses in the doorway. His daughter helps him to bed, and finding his open diary starts to read, with Quo's peaceful sleeping face serving as the backdrop. The film ends with a sepia scene of the aging Quo strolling on a breezy open field with his young wife and daughter on the either side, holding hands they walk in slow motion, smiling at the camera, and then the frame freezes. Since it is impossible that the old Quo could exist in the same time frame with his wife and daughter when they were young, this scene can only be imaginary. The most logical explanation is that it is Quo's dream, but it is also possible that Xiu Jin is imagining it upon reading his, her father's diary. Ultimately, we must consider the final shot to be a shared and perhaps imagined memory for father and daughter. It is a memory of the past and at the same time, memory for their future. In a, fashion, in a similar fashion, in a fashion similar to the use of fabricated memory, Super Citizen Guo also incorporates archival footage at two critical junctures. These two segments, one from the late colonial period and the other from the early days of national rules, share striking similarities both in their docu documentary nature and their function in the film, both featuring a display of military prowess of the ruling governments. These documentary excerpts appear in a nearly seamless manner after flashbacks of former political prisoners. They create intriguing ideological interpretations of historical event and offer a personalized view of Taiwan's past by just posing personal flashbacks with archival footage. The first archival footage appears when Guo succeeds in locating the first person implicated in the reading group, Yeo Min Shun, a musician who lives in a dilapidated illegal shack and earns a living by playing for funerals and weddings alike. I'm willing to talk to talk to talk about Chen Zheng Yi. Yeo focused instead on earlier time when Po and Yeo were classmates and comrades in arm after being drafted by the Japanese colonial government to fight in the Pacific War. Yeo then walks out 
into the ramshackle yard and he plays in march with the military music playing in the background we first see a black and white scene with which yo four and three others from the same village sit for a photographer before they are sent to the battlefield at the bl flare of the photographer's flash the camera cuts to documentary footage showing marching soldiers and a troop inspection by the Japanese Governor General of Taiwan, followed by archival films of battle scenes, including dead soldiers lying in trenches, with the militant music continuing to play, and a, but at a lower volume. The camera cuts to archival footage, or something looks like archival footage, <laughs> of Kuo and another soldier, possibly Yo arriving at a Japanese house where deceased soldiers' families kneel to receive their bones. This mixture of historical documentary film and fictional characters' flashback ends with Kuo and Yo crying with the family as the camera cuts to the roots of illegal threading in Taipei of the 1990s. The immediately discernible significance of this segment is the ironic effect created when the archival footage clashes with the personal flashback. Yo was sentenced to six years because he paid a visit to his old classmate, Kuo. We can infer that Yo, like so many victims of the white terror, su suffered both in prison and after his release. Constant harassment from local police and difficulties in finding steady employment were but two of the most common forms of persecution, even after people served undeserved prison sentences. It is therefore understandable that Yeo would prefer not to discuss Chen of any related matter. Instead, he prefers to recall an earlier time when, as loyal subjects of the Japanese emperor, they were treated with the greatest honor of dying for the emperor. The recollection of the delivery of dead soldiers' bones is clearly from Quo's perspective, as we see the camera zoom in on his sobbing face. Hence, what is glorious for Yo represents only death in Quo's memory. But the irony of the archival footage becomes even sharper when contrasted with another footage whose appearance is pregnant with ideological implications and political meanings. In a scene that triggers a combination of documentary film images and personal flashbacks, Kuo goes to visit Professor Wu, who puts on his headphone when Kuo inquires into the whereabouts of Chen. Kuo lifts one of the earphones and hears an, an anti-communist propaganda song. Then we see a black and white documentary of the double tenth celebration with Jiang Kai-shek inspecting the troops. As the shrill voice continues drone on about the importance of recovering the mainland, the image of tanks displaying the political prowess of the KMT regime segue into military trucks rushing in and disgorging soldiers to arrest Guo and other members of the reading group. The functions of doc the documentary footage are manifold. First, they serve as an ironic reminder of the post-martial law audience, the absurdity that most of them lived through. As argued by a film historian, because the historical film by definition refers to a past reality known to most viewers prior to the film, either from experience or from re representation, they enjoy the effect of recognition this extra reference, which appeals to historical knowledge and knowledge that exists outside of the film's fictional sphere, produces an additional level of meaning and increases the meaning of potential for the film." End of quote. Moreover, the documentary footage serves to highlight the damaged mental state of Wu and, by extension, other political prisoners. Most importantly, it constitutes a silent accusation against the fascist state apparatus that, in the name of recovering the mainland and resisting the communists, hunted down and persecuting many people, instilled a pervasive fear in everyone's life, and destroyed people like Professor Wu, Guo, and many others. The juxtaposition of real archival footage and the fictional depiction of Guo's arrest has a subtle levering effect in that the real is fictionalized, while the fictional gains a sense of realism. 
As Anton Keyes argues in his discussion of Fassbinder's historical film, and quote, the viewer senses, even if unconsciously, the unresolvable dual status of historical narratives as document and fiction, authenticity, uh, authentically true and at the same time used within a freely invented story. End of quote. Ultimately, however, super citizen quote emphasizes more the question of how real the historical footage is. For as the Taiwanese who lived through the era can attest, the troop inspection was nothing but a stage display, a myth of the Republic of China. For all intents and purposes, the archival footage is as fictional as the film in which it is used. Placed side by side, the two excerpts of archival footage reveal startling similarities. For instance, the troop inspections by the Governor General of Colonial Taiwan and Chiang Kai-shek are nearly identical with the same kind of amorphous soldiers group stepping before the podium in front of the presidential palace office. Taylor Downing's analysis of history on television is also appropriate here regarding footage in fictional film. And the quote, in newsreels, public information films, works of propaganda, or television newscast, film frequently not only captures an impression of what an event looked like, but gives a topical and awful, often revealing interpretation of that event. End of quote. Used several decades later, the incorporation of the archival footage in Super Citizen Quote presents a new interpretation that may be in direct opposition of the original intent. That is, the military and the governor general slash president in front of their office are both symbols of the state. But for the Taiwanese, the definition of state war is extremely complex. Complex. Post-martial law debates over the issue of national identity often brings up the question of whether the nationalist government was another colonial government, just like the Japanese. Super Citizen War does not appear to throw on this question, but does hint at the issue of national identity with its title, Citizen Guomin. One wonders which state is being referred to in the film. It could well be a declaration of political allegiance in the sense that a citizen of a given country <coughs> should have the inalienable right to congregate freely to read any material he or she wishes without fear of persecution. Among the films that deal with acts of government brutality and suppression of dissent in Taiwan, Super Citizen War is, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, the only one in which the victim comes face to face with a member of the garrison command who carried out the arrest. But the central theme of rede redemption overshadowed the issue of culpability. To be sure, we should be cognizant of this kind of um, justice as is explicated by Paul Benzel, and I quote, the punishment of perpetrators is crucial to dealing with the past but it will always be insufficient response to mass atrocity, and any successful attempt to deal with the past must seek to explore other strategies to make a victim's whole and to prevent a reoccurrence of the past abuse." End of quote. Yet, Guo's search for truth, that is, the burial site of Chen, unconditionally validates and legitimates the need for reconciliation. Hence, what one sees is the tormenting of Guo's conscience over unwillingly revealing Chen's name. Perversely, Guo is the guilty one. He suffers years of isolation in prison and at the nursing home, and his wife commits suicide. Here, I'm reminded of Guan abandoned plan to make a movie about a revenge, which would have likely resulted in a melodrama. Instead, the film he eventually made uses Guo's guilt not only as a plot device, but also as a lesson in accountability. Guo feels guilty about revealing Chen's name and spent his post-incarceration days in self-reproach. While the former soldier lives a guilt-free life 
and those higher up who order the arrest and execution remain completely unseen yeah. and unaffected. Mm -hmm. By turning the world upside down and making the former political prisoners the guilty one, the film brings a powerful indictment against the government. Mm -hmm. At the end of the movie, when Guo finally finds the site where Chen and others who were not identified by their families are buried, he lights up the bamboo grove with candles and offers his apology to Chen Zhengyi. This overriding concern with closure entails an urge to move forward and contradicts the earlier moments in the film where a painstaking effort is invested in recollecting and recreating a memory of the white terror. By saying this, I'm not arguing that one must dwell on the past, but rather questioning whether Quo's action in the end mirrors the tired slogan of forgiveness in the post martial law atmosphere of reconciliation. Robert Chi's comments can help illustrate my concern. And quote, Super Citizen Quo enacts a cathartic closure and was lauded as being much warmer as compared with another movie by Ho Xiaoxian, and hence more intimate, more humane, more moving. And the, for it offers a memory that audience were more likely to identify with, be moved by, assent to, and remember." End of quote. In the audience appreciation of the film and sympathy for its tormented protagonist, a public memory about the white terror is formed out of quote's fictional past but one must be wary of what is gained beyond knowing what happened. If a fictional or cinematic work, work overemphasizes closure by means of an Aristotelian formula of conflict and denouement, it can degenerate into a simplistic and therapeutic feel-good ethos in general or a vapid triumphalism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia, you know, for a really a beautifully written paper. <laughs> um, I have one comment and now one question, and the comment really actually inspired by your uh, speech. Um, I have always believed that um, the martial law acted something like to freeze social memory of Taiwan, uh, especially uh, atrocities in terms of that kind of memory. And so once the martial law was lifted, is all of a sudden um, the frozen 40 years just become open gate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those very old memories of uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago become very immediate, very present. And I think in uh, Super Citizen Quo's final scene that you recall was a perfect embodiment of that. It was actually present mm -hmm. uh, and the past coexisting. Mm -hmm. It's because of this uh, allowance, you know, to, to make that become a possibility, mm -hmm. and speak of, uh, people can reclaim their their, their past uh, in order to continue the present and search for future. So yeah, so so that's my comment. Uh, my question actually is uh, coming from yesterday's director Wang Ren's own comment. Um, I think he was still very. Um, passionate and uh, actually believe that Taiwan need transitional justice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then was in pain that actually this wasn't achieved. Mm -hmm. However, I think his own film ironically probably point out to us how difficult to to make that process as a very quick fix because if you just find scapegoat mm -hmm. it's not necessarily transitional justice mm -hmm. and probably not going to help the society move on. So my question to you is, what's your view on how to search or continue search for this transitional justice for Taiwan? Um, I, can't, uh, I can't give you an answer for that because I'm not a uh, legal scholar. But I, I agree with you completely. And I, um, to be honest with you, I wrote this book in um, 2006, it was published in 2007, and because of the invitation, I uh, watched the film again. I changed some of my views <coughs> on that, uh, the 
you know, about ten, almost ten years ago. Um, at when I f wrote the book and I look at the film and I must, I saw the film many times and wanted to write this chapter. Um, I was more critical of the movie. I feel that I, I didn't like the ending. I thought it was too feel good. Um, it, but maybe um, after almost ten years, um, a, a decade, and being older, okay, or a, being having a distance between the book and so I I looked at it and I became much more sympathetic to the film and. The fact that how first of all you can't make a film about someone seeking revenge. How would you do it? It would be just to, to absolutely awful. Okay, so you find a person, you confront the person, and then what? You want to put them in jail. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the question that he, he raises in the movie is more valuable than whatever he's trying to to, to say. Mm -hmm. okay. so I think he probably believes in some form of justice. But at the same time, for him to do a film like that, it would be very hard and probably would not be as valuable as what we have. It's, it's a question, race and issue. So if uh, um, um, quote was, was to, yes, he did find a person, okay? but then, then what? Mm -hmm. What happened next? It, it doesn't go anywhere. And I, I really like the scene after 10 years when I see it again. I really like that scene. I thought it was really powerful. Mm -hmm. So I don't have an answer, but I, I do believe that there needs to be some form of justice. And, and the problem with white terror and the problem with um, the 2 to 8 incident, the similar situation, was there was such a uh, hurry to address the issue. So. Uh, the, a lot of time the, the focus was on um, monetary uh, compensation. There was also the uh, dispute or argument over which word we use. Okay, do we use uh, compensation or pay chang or bu chang? And they both the, the, they have very different political meanings. Okay? And so, but there was so much focus on how much we should to compensate the, mon the family for and. Um, let's see if money could solve everything, and, and there was no accountability. And then now, of course, the, the another form of revision is, has come in to trying to rewrite that part of the history. So um, I think this film is still relevant in these days, but I don't have an answer for you. Great. Uh, David? Yeah, uh, like, like me, yeah, I think I probably had more of a, uh, uh, a comment rather than a uh, question. Uh, okay, I apologize to you there. Um, I mean, I, I suppose the thing that really attracted me initially to this film was the representation of the 1990s. The, um, uh, the um, uh, demonstrations, electoral politics, uh, the way the... Um, um, uh, he just just can't understand what's going on mm. in, in, in the world. And, and I suppose one scene that I particularly, I mean, I thought there was a lot of humor in the film, and we could think about it as a tragedy, but that was one of the things that I really enjoyed, particularly the scene where the father-in-law, um, um, who turned, eventually gets arrested for political corruption, gives him the credit card and the mobile phone. And then, of course, we've got the scenes about watching the um, uh, stock market. Um, so. Um, it was a, I thought it was a nice mix of tragedy and, and, and humor. Um, so for, for me, I think, having lived through the 1990s, I think it was, it was a really nice way to think about the 1990s, as well as, as your kind of white terror uh, era. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Or comments? Yeah. Or comments. OK, so we've not had actually a question. Next to the kid, I'll be fighting too much. That's what keeps you fit, isn't it? Hi. It's very interesting, but um, I think I counted something like six or seven different forms of memory mm. in your paper. You begin with a dichotomy between a sort of habit memory and a sort of learned memory. Of. But then you bring in fabricated memory. Mm. And the thing I have a puzzle with is, whilst I think your story 
and then the way you do a sort of a narrative, an analytical narrative, is very interesting. And I'm not going to really quarrel with that. Really. Um, the, the methodological question would be: How are you? What What are you using to deconstruct and analyze this notion of fabricated memory? I would have thought it was an almost impossible task. Mm -hmm. You've got the fabricated memory as presented in the film itself, mm -hmm. which is your prime task, I guess. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the, the, the possible, conceivable, real, fabricated memory of actual people at that time doing the, doing the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got, um, it seems to me, a really a, a complex mythological problem of possible alternative stories. One can imagine a whole bunch of alternative stories about what the fabricated memory, well, the identification of the fabricated memory, first of all, mm -hmm. and then its interpretation. Mm -hmm. You have given us a particular interpretation of that, which is very interesting. But what is the methodology behind that? I mean, could someone else come along who's uh, trained in your area and give us a different version of the same fabricated memory, once identified? Mm -hmm. do, do you absolutely. see what I'm getting at? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I can uh, imagine someone else write a, a completely different uh, article about you you? It. yeah, and that's why this movie is so interesting, mm -hmm. uh, precisely because there are so many things you can talk about. Mm -hmm. Like what David was just saying, the his angle, the the representation of Taiwan in the 1990s, as contrasted with the earlier period that the film implies, but didn't make any kind of uh, very overt um, uh, comments on the, the fathers inability to be incorporated into society was part of the new Taiwan that he didn't know. So there are this, there's so many things in this, this movie that you can talk about and even with just the memory itself, you, there's so many things you can, you can talk about. And I have to say that I use the word memory very loosely, um, not, um, not in the sense that this is my memory or someone else. This is, so it's more or less memory in the sense that it's something happens in the past, that whether it's real or not. That it's so that's it's more like a recollection rather than memory of what or sometimes the, the dream scene, for instance. Mm -hmm. That's really not memory per se because mm -hmm. he obviously has dreams about it. So it could be dreams. It could be in a way fabricated because he could not have seen the execution. So I agree with you completely. If you can write um, an article. You can write an article about this film that is completely different, the opposite of what I just said. And it's fine. <laughs> and that's why I say if you have any comments, it doesn't have to be a question. You have a different reading. That would be wonderful because then we get more um, appreciation of the movie than just me talking for 45 minutes or however long I took. Right, that's great. Um, anyone? Yes, please. This young lady here uh, was here yesterday. She was the third generation of the family of the victim. So she's uh, probably have a very intimate uh, uh, reaccount of her own experience. Should I talk my story, or I, ju I just would like to answer about the question about the memory, like the excuse. Um, during the 1950s, they were shoot two photos before and after excuse. And yeah, I think this must the dead people, the last photo in the world. And all these before and after photo will put on a document and send to Chiang Kai Shek, and Chiang Kai Shek will write. Okay, I have seen this mm -hmm. for a V person, mm -hmm. and so I think that one uh, because I have seen this photo, I have seen at least four hundred people's photo like this, including my grandfather. So I think that that memory about the excuse is nearly accurate because mm -hmm. everyone seems like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Well, maybe I should ask you a question. Um, Actually, I, I found Ian's question interesting, but I felt that's the whole point of uh, making it more pragmatic, sorry, problematic. Actually, it is raising the question rather than giving an answer. Now, now I definitely, actually, when I read that chapter, I really love it, even though you think you changed your mind, but I really love that chapter. Um, 
and I really like uh, the way you, how you blend the uh, different scene together and how retell the story in a different way, even sometimes not contradict, not to contrast each other consciously. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think you did a great job on there. <laughs> And uh, um, actually, if you have the chance, you should read that article. It's really brilliant. And we got it uh, in our library. But can I just ask a question? Um, because yesterday, Warren did say, um, now as a 60 years old or 60 something old, uh, year old uh, man, he felt uh, very differently. And looking back at this uh, uh, film, he wouldn't change anything. Okay, that's quite interesting. And I was just thinking, maybe aging or being a bit older also change a little bit about this kind of uh, a tragedy or a historical event. You probably have a different take on this. What do you think about why you change your mind? And looking back, some of some part of the film is still very relevant today. And what's your take on that as well? So why it makes it timeless? Um, there, there, okay, there's two different levels of to the, two different approaches to the answer your um, question. Um, what made the movie timeless? Um, I think 10 years ago I thought it was precisely because the, the so-called more humane approach the lighting of the candles and the search. I thought that was the reason why this movie could have relevance because it's easy. It doesn't put you off. And the movie I, um, I was I mentioned <coughs> later in the article that um, Robert you mentioned was um, good, good man, good mm. woman. How na how by uh, um, Ho Xiaoxian. And that movie is the opposite. That movie was very, it, it really does try to put a distance between the audience and the film because it has a movie within a movie. And um, I, oh, I used to think that was the reason why it, it would have any kind of lasting power but because it appealed, it's more uh, easily um, digestible. Yeah. But then when I look at it again, I, I feel like, um, Maybe it's it's going to be seen again and again, maybe for a very long time. Is precisely because the questions that it's been raised without any kind of answer that part of the reason why I changed my mind about the interpreting the whole idea of closure and and in the past I faulted him for not for making a feel good movie, but now I feel like yes. He, it's very subtle, but the question is there, and it's up to us, the audience, to get that message. He's setting up the parallel between these different, you know, the victim and the victimizer, and the apparatus of those behind the victimizers, and how it's set up, and very nicely. And that, I think, for Taiwan, probably that would have more um, lasting effect. Like maybe one day people in Taiwan will come back to this part of the history and look at it differently. And yeah. I don't know if any kind of justice could be sought by, yeah. by that time, but still, people would look at it differently. Yes, please. Um, I don't have a question, but I uh, also have a comment. And thank you very much for your speech today. And I think it's particularly interesting that you mentioned at the end of your speech that your point of view about this movie um, changed um, quite different from 10 years ago. Um, you are now more sympathetic. And I, I just experienced the total opposite process. You know, I first saw this movie uh, 20 years ago, 21st, when it was first presented. And Back then, I was uh, really young and, and was uh, totally ignorant about the past history. Mm. And after a very long and sad movie, I think that ending uh, really made me feel you know, a little bit comfort mm -hmm. and, and then start uh, personally my own uh, research about um, the town history. Mm -hmm. But right now, after 20 years, I saw this movie again, and I felt how little progress we have made as a society. Mm -hmm. You can see 
nowadays we are still uh, arguing about uh, new the nuclear plan, mm -hmm. and we still have all those uh, problems, and we never, never uh, overcome the problems um, of transitional justice. We never ask about who did this to whom, mm -hmm. and so I think my um, dissatisfaction about that ending uh, comes from my dissatisfaction about our own society. I think we did too little mm -hmm. to make progress on this this um, history. So, um, um, for example, I think we owe uh, owe a lot of apology to um, victims' family, and we also um, did very little to think about uh, our past and also create. Uh, actively create a collective memory. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it is the never ending enterprise. Mm -hmm. And and so yesterday's ending really remind me that you know it's really you know feeling too good mm -hmm. about our own society. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the comment. I think um, it's very poignant in that your experience is precisely um, it's a very good explanation for the background of the movie. I think uh, you also mentioned a, a little bit earlier how at the time when the movie was made, there was this need because we just came out of that period. And the, the society itself needed that kind of consolation, needed that kind of uh, closure, the, the uplifting. He found the grave, he was able to apologize. And at least one person is conscience is clear now. And that kind of feeling was very important to Taiwanese at that time, I think. I think Taiwanese at that time probably could not handle something more drastic. So but um, as your comment shows, now twenty some years later you look at you're unhappy with it, you're dissatisfied because you feel like we needed more. And that itself may be a very good reason or very good motivational force that some, you know, another better film could be made, not better, I'm sorry to say that, <laughs> but a different film uh, could be made to address that issue differently. And um, a film is also a product of its time. It reflects its, the time, the people who, uh, who made it, people who were, the film were made for, so I think it's very, your, your comments is describe that time very nicely. Thank you. David, please. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I had a kind of um, uh, follow-up question that, that kind of ties in with what some of you are saying, because I think it was really interesting to see how uh, both of you had reacted differently. Uh, mm -hmm. Your kind of views have changed on the film. And one of the questions I asked Wainan last night was about to what extent have um, audience reactions changed over the 20 years. I didn't really get much He said of it. no. He said no. Although he said it, it's the same. Yes, although I'm not really convinced that's really the case. I mean, if we, if we think about it, when the film comes out, Taiwanese education was just yes. getting started. Uh, but we've had a decade and a half of at least some coverage of Taiwanese uh, history and, and society in, in education. So. In theory, then, um, the audiences should know more um, about this, this kind of background. Um, so I, I, I think it would be really interesting to, to actually do some kind of science, systematic research to see how the audiences react nowadays. And Yesterday, I, yes. he did say um, his observation mainly on uh, you know, going around universities. Mm -hmm. I suppose that sort of quite actually narrowed down what sort of people uh, he's talking about, mm -hmm. you know, that, that sort of well, better educated or, you know, uh, intellectually more informed sort of audience. Maybe he's comparing, you know, similar sort of people rather than comparing different periods. Mm -hmm. I suppose a kind of, uh, a kind of follow-up question would be, um, to what extent have you seen a, a better portrayal of white terror since that, that film? I mean, mm -hmm. initially I would think about um, uh, I mean, although that's coming towards the end of, of, of this, this period, uh, or a couple of years ago we had the uh, Formosa Betrayed, which was a bit of a, uh, quite a messy uh, film. Um, 
it, so at least in my view, that this one seems to handle that period much better. But I don't know, if, are there any other you would recommend? Oh. Let me see. Um, I don't know. Uh, I can't think of anything. No. I, I also have to apologize if I sound somewhat incoherent. I just got in uh, yesterday, and so <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my, uh, I'm wavering between two time zones, so sometimes if I sound really weird, they know it's, kind of, it's not because of what I drank before <laughs> the lecture. But I, I do want to say something completely unrelated that I found quite uh, relevant. I once read a um, I saw up a piece in the New York Times about um, how liberating it was for a, a young Jewish, uh, German Jews to be living in New York. Um, he mentioned that when he was in Germany, people, every time people ask him about his background and then knowing that he's Jewish, the German um, his German friends or new acquaintances were always had this momentary, momentary, taken aback, kind of like, mm. oh, okay, now how do I deal with this person, and knowing the German history, and and then at one point he said it got so, I I don't think tiring is the right word, but he just felt really that he had to constantly deal with himself being a Jew living in Germany in 21st century dealing with Germans whose parents or grandparents might have persecuted the Jews. So once he moved to, to New York, um, besides the fact that there are a lot of you know, Jews in New York, also the fact that he never had to apologize for being a Jew in Germany again. And I think, um, I don't know how much of a young Taiwanese reaction to his film, as he described, was no, no difference. How much of that is really no difference or how much of that had to do with the fact that perhaps there is a fatigue. Like the, the, the young Taiwanese felt this kind of fatigue about their past. So there is also a danger when you keep talking about it and to a point that people just don't want to talk about it anymore. They wanted to look forward instead of backwards. So but it, I don't know if it has something to do with that or mainly they just become apathetic or they, um, Whatever. Actually, in our summer school, one um, mainlander, maybe third generation, apologized to be a mainlander, <laughs> third generation. One girl, she's saying, and now I just think it's very interesting. It's almost like that. It's mirroring, saying, "I'm so sorry that you know." It's, I don't know what her parents did, but or grandparents, but you know, you seemingly being wise bad enough. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I hope I can be articulate enough, um, but I do have sort of a vaguely two questions. One actually is, I, I, you know, you also mentioned about um, Citizen Quo, or actually people saying about him pursuing idealism. Um, and I actually was not very satisfied with this particular description because it was really not very sure about what his idealism is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so by just reading books which were forbidden, mm -hmm. it's not idealism. Mm -hmm. But by conforming to claim that is idealism, in some way sort of justify that he's been imprisoned in some way because it was he subversive, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that was really... So, so actually, I, I think actually this particular description about his pursuing of idealism mm -hmm. in his youth mm -hmm. itself for me, it's quite problematic mm -hmm. in the film, and I don't know how you, you know, your view about that. And secondly, it's actually about the 1990s. I feel it's a very opaque era because my recollection, again, could be because of a, a whitewashed by the celebration of democratization. So it seems to be very optimistic. And then now, actually, you see on screen and also try to remember back, mm -hmm. things actually was very opaque, mm -hmm. um, yeah. still very bad. So I just actually wonder, anybody here um, remember 1990s much better? <laughs> Probably can. Yeah. Um, for example, a film language was abolished eventually, you know, that particular restriction about using. But some, sometime in the 1990s, actually I'm not very sure when. And also from the citizen world, the portrayal of the 1990s, almost as bad as the under martial law. I mean, especially politics really, really mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. So so really, I just 
not very sure how, how truthful that representation of the 1990s really is, if anybody have any can vouch for that. Thank you. I guess I'll just answer the first question about idealism. I, I think that that's part of whether intentionally or not, that's one thing I found really wonderful about the movie because um, to me, the whole problem of white terror or persecution was whether one was idealist or not okay, was the reason to arrest people and try, mm -hmm. try them behind closed doors and, and not, sometimes not even telling them, the family mm -hmm. that their son or their fathers have been executed and or demand a fee to reclaim the bodies. If you cannot reduce that money, your, your, your family's member's body was just left and buried someplace. You never find the body again. And to use that, um, the, the whole idea of reading, say, they, they're really reading Marxist thoughts. And that somehow justified the government's action. I think it's inexcusable. Okay? To me, whether they're reading or not is besides the point. It's it, a government. A government should have never arrested and executed people in that fashion. And so, um, so in the movie, was was uh, citizen, super citizen court was he an idealist? We don't know. Mm. But is, was that important? Mm. If he wasn't, uh, so for look at it differently. Look at that, the former soldier who arrested him. Um, he seems to say, he, that was also a very interesting scene for me, because at one point he said, how would you read that kind of book at a time like this? Okay. And that, of course, that's, that's like a, uh, the 1990s perspective on that, uh, that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he seemed to say, well, no, you, sh you should not read that kind of book because it's prohibited. So, therefore, you deserve to be uh, arrested and executed. Yes, I agree with you completely. I think it's the only thing, I think, problematic to call him idealist. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly like you said, whether or not he's an idealist, it shouldn't be the, uh, shouldn't be the excuse for government to do mm -hmm. what it did. Mm -hmm. so, so, I'm uh, on that same page. But I think by calling him idealist in such a vague way, mm -hmm in some way is make him a hero, mm -hmm. which again, you know, that's, you know, being a victim, not necessarily being a hero. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, so for that particular um, sort of branding, mm -hmm. of just simply called because he's in prison mm -hmm. and he was heroified, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel it's problematic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree completely that, that somehow the victims are always <laughs> he heroic and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it probably make us feel good, but it doesn't help with the situation at all. Great. Oh, Peter, finally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back to your title here. But in your view, with these atrocities, white terror to do aid, how, in your view, could this, um, how, how can some, you know, this accountability for these, these terrible atrocities, how can they, how can you, how can you bring about that such accountability? Because I think for society, what is it, we are, what we are seeing is there is there is apparently no accountability. You know, giving money to bereaved families. To be honest, I don't like the words bereaved families because it's bereavement for the whole country. Whether your immediate families were victims or not, the whole country, whole society is a victim mm -hmm. because you know killing a. You know, to what they have done, you know, you mu we mustn't concentrate on just simply or oh, somebody was killed and somebody's family members were killed. Mm -hmm. it, it's not just that. It's, it goes far beyond that. Mm -hmm. It goes far beyond just the immediate family. It has, you know, implications for the whole of Taiwanese culture, geography, what you can, you know, history, everything. Mm -hmm. So what, I feel, what I'm not very happy with in, in Taiwan is where is such accountability? There is there's apparently not. And coming back to your title, how do you, in your in, in your view, bring about such accountability? Oh, that's a huge <laughs> <thing. laughs> <laughs> It I I don't I don't think I have an answer for that. I think my question, my issue, is more to do with 
it's how is it presented in the movie. Mm -hmm. But personally, um, I agree with you completely. There was no, um, there was, I guess most important issue was how do you prosecute the people who are still living in the same society and, and they are very much well connected. And um, I read someplace uh, the writer Li Yang went to uh, this mass grave with um, Gu Zhengwen, that's the guy who was part very much the, the head of the secret service. He was completely unapologetic. Okay. And and being um, being part of the uh, well connected you know uh, member of the KMT, it would be impossible. And then there are also some school of thought about uh, accountability or even um, retribution. Is if you do that, you can turn the whole society upside down, and you will create something even worse. Okay. And so. In a way, it's not that dissimilar to what happened in China after the Cultural Revolution. They continue to go back and live together, be neighbors again, even though one accused the other of something and then t caused a death in, the mem in, in another family. They continue, they went back and lived as neighbors again. And I, I'm not, I don't entirely agree with the idea that if you try to prosecute then the society would necessarily be turned upside down because there, there needs to be a level of justice. But then the next question is how far up can you go? And you all go the way up is to Chiang Kai-shek. And remember, Chiang Kai-shek's son was a grandson, the son of grandson, was incredibly unhappy with books pointing the uh, finger at his father for being the, the one who caused all these problems. And even brought a suit against the scholars who uh, compiled that, that two volumes. Yeah. And so it, it will probably shake the core of the whole society. So um, again, you know, do we, do we look for a, a stability? And do people want that? I don't know. Do people really want to have um, the, the country um, plunge into that kind of investigation for years, and I, I don't know, but I personally I do wish there were something more substantial than just monetary compensation. Thinking, yeah. Just may I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. 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 I have, I have. Control. I want to kind of link to your chapter, actually, in the book of which we've brought today, the book that you've done around. Now, in the book yourself, you you choose a different film to to kind of um, a documentary. Um, I think the title is like Why We Can't Dance. I think that's. Well, why don't we sing? Why don't we sing? <laughs> sing and dancing. But um, yeah, so in that in that documentary, I was just wondering um, because you you're covering very similar themes and very ideas about how how history is represented through film, whether that film is documentary mm -hmm. or or as we have seen in the movie yesterday. So I just want you perhaps if you could just make me a few minutes just to talk about the differences that you found in representation of that particular period in documentary as well as the film that we saw saw yesterday. So probably a little introduction to your to your edited book really. Very good thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That's a, a good plug. Um, with with um, documentary film to me it's much more interesting to be honest with you here. Uh, even though I wrote uh, half of my book is about uh, fictional films representation of atrocity, I, I think um, documentary film for this specific incident or for the white terror era, um, what interested me most is the, what does this, what purpose does it serve? It, is it serving to so-called reveal the truth? So why don't we sing? We have all these um, uh, eyewitnesses or uh, survivors of a, a white, uh, the former political prisoners who talk about their experience. Okay? And that is 
probably the very first fundamental purpose of the documentary film to have people telling what happened. Okay. And then um, and then after you, you tell people what happens, then your next step is to do what? To give people a more accurate uh, record of real events? Or to me, that movie, uh, the documentary, Why Don't We Sing, was also to explain to the audience what, why it happened. Okay? But then when we are getting into the why, then it's a matter of interpretation, okay, why it happened. And my, um, I think it's, it's a very good record with all these survivors and talking about their experience. But on the other hand, my set dissatisfaction with that movie was the fact that they, um, the group of producers had an idea that um, it's all about communism. Like these were, were leftists and, and they have all these leftists and it was not something tolerated by the, um, the uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government because they're uh, left-leaning and they're reading, um, they're uh, promoting uh, Marxist ideas. Okay. And, and to me, that was too narrow uh, an approach and this kind of go back to what I said earlier about um, um, the, and then no government should persecute its own people like that, no matter whether they are communists or not, or whether they are pro-communists or not. They, um, it's just simply not what a government should be doing. And the, the movie is, the, the documentary is a little bit too narrow in that interpretation. And um, if you read that, if you purchase the book and read the chapter, <laughs> I, in that book I also did give a, um, two different interpretations, different um, um, interpretation or uh, definition, true definition for the white terror era. Uh, some people believe that the focus on the 1950s, okay? but for me, um, it's up all the way up to the end of martial law, okay? because if you are just 15, focusing on the 1950s, if the whole threat was thrust of it, it was more or less to do with leftist, you know, anti-communist. Okay, but if you look at it, uh, even up to you know 1979 with the Merida um, movement, uh, the the incident, there wasn't that had nothing to do with communism. That was purely pro-democracy and pro and the government persecution of the protesters are exactly the same. So it's not really because of this or that, but the focus is more to do with how a government deals with dissent mm -hmm. and how m much tolerance that you should give to um, or true democracy should be open to this kind of dissent, whether it is communist, Marxist, or democracy or pro-Taiwan independence. Great, thank you. Um, I think we are run, running out of time. <laughs> Can I just talk about the book? Would that be oh, okay? yes. Um, before Nick is talking about the book, um, let's give Del Tilly another round of applause. Thank you very much.